as to as you.
cambio de ser una cosa que se hace con normalidad a una cosa que se hace con dificultad. Y ahí vamos a tener que estar muy atentos. And that brings me very neatly, I hope, to the notion of resistance. And you can already see where these things start to intersect a little bit. Um, so, and this is the final chapter of the book, which I'll get to a little bit later. But, but the notion of resistance um, is, again, predicated on the advanced public worldview, where core cultural elements are seen as warring, uh, different in stature, and therefore unable to govern. Uh, and much like uh, the, the example I just uh, described of the fall of the constitution, this is also something that's consumed around the constitution, so Article 1, Clause 4, focus on the, the, the advanced public is considered the attainment of independence, freedom, and rule of government for the average people, uh, to abstain from the clinical experience in the internal affairs of other nations is to court the just but rule of democracy <coughs> alone for the oppressed or oppressed by kings or rulers or tyrants and so these things as well now that uh, as i mentioned already that kind of thinking found its expression through the hands of the ayatollah uh, in the fight against israel um, the flag as you can see you probably recognize these iranian um, palestinian syrian and, and hezbollah flags um, you know, Syria is a key component of that too. You know, very much a secular state, so has a but has a key geopolitical role in the fight against Israel, and has the right hand of course of Hezbollah. So you can already see uh, when it's a geopolitical expedient of sorts, uh, when one is there, the other doesn't have that level. Um, so the you know the individual identity of the Iranian state is very um, obvious there. And the notion of the axis of resistance, you know, which is arguably uh, within the form of alliance networks. Community of supporters of the community as well. That has particularly expanded in, in recent years to include the Iraqi Revolutionary Liberation Forces, you know, the Houthis in Yemen, the two Palestinian factions that are seen as part of this resistance, like primarily Hamas, for example, and now the Hezbollah fighting for the right of Palestine. And of course, all representatives from these different groups were at the front and center of those uh, liberation movements, and they were responsible for the ones taking up front row in support of uh, the Hezbollah and Hamas forces. So they're important groups there. That manifests not just in the well-known material support that's provided to Hezbollah and, and Iran's Iraqi allies. It also manifests in more interesting ways, and, and you know, most of my work is on, uh, again, more kind of cultural diplomacy links, soft power, and projecting that kind of thing. So uh, memorialized spaces in Lebanon is a really interesting area where this uh, identity is manifested. This picture you can see here, uh, taken from a field trip I took to um, place called Marun al-Ras, which is a place with the Iranian gardens uh, right on the border with Israel. So if you can see this line at the top corner, this is the Israeli border and there's the Israeli settlements on the other side. This is a Iranian-made replica of the Dome of the Rock, which is recognized as one of the holiest sites in Islam, top of <coughs> an Iranian flag. Um, so, you know, there are you know, cultural diplomacy efforts, you know, work with the Hezbollah to conduct an army that will take out that religious revolutionaries to take out the Hezbollah troops that are coming forward. Um, but this, this kind of stuff has a, uh, I would say, uh, a wider import beyond the region as well. <coughs> and that's where some more systemic issues come in, you know, um, because it chafes against the, the predominant US-led conceptions of world and regional order as well. Uh, I mean, you can see an example of this actually, I mean, <coughs> I forgot to mention this, but this middle picture here, you know, equate it, this is from a resistance art event that I attended in Beirut that was hosted by the Iranian Cultural Center. And you know, this equation of ISIS you know, with US funding, you know, Israel and, and, and ISIS being um, two sides of the same, same coin. That's, it's quite blunt imagery, but you, know, you have these interesting cultural production forms as well, which I think um, are really interesting. And, and you know, I think this is also important in terms of you know, wider conceptions of global and, and indeed regional order. Uh, you see in this is been operationalized by Iran in, in pursuing a shared sense of solidarity with uh, other counter-hegemonic forces in, in global politics. So we have links developed by Iran with, with elements of the pink tide in Latin America, most notably, obviously, with, with, with Venezuela and Cuba, but, you know, uh, better relations with more left-leaning governments, with more anti-American governments, of course, with Russia and, uh, and, of course, with China as well. Okay, so... None of this is <laughs> probably that new necessarily. You'll all recognize these as important signifiers, I suspect, you know, especially in terms of Iran's own immediate geopolitical environment. But what I want to present now is, is, is really a schema uh, for understanding what these components are. So we've, we've outlined them and how they relate to each other to give meaning to Iranian foreign policy. So this 
Um, it's just a diagram I put together. And because I'm a complete magpie, I like to borrow from, from everywhere. I borrowed this idea of, of ikigai, which is a, a Japanese concept. Now, this is much more commonly used on a, on a kind of personal level, personal development level. It's something that gives a person a sense of purpose or meaning in their life. So it might be, you know, you in the middle, you know, your work, your friends, your, your interests, your, your home or whatever, um, to give that sort of sense of meaning. Now, now, I like this idea because not just because it is about giving meaning and purpose, you know, providing a way of identifying where, where that meaning comes from, but it's actually symbolized by a very neat Venn diagram, which I think helps visualize what, some of what I'm trying to explain here rather than these just being disparate things. And I think where things get quite interesting, certainly for me, uh, perhaps I'm alone in this, but is, is where you have the intersection. So where, you know, where these circles of identity, these forms of identity, where they intersect and cross over. So if we take where Shiism and the resistance meet, a clear example of where that's manifested is in, in, in Hezbollah. You know, as, as I've mentioned several times already, you know, it's founded on Iran's support for, for Lebanese Shia in their resistance against the Israeli occupation during the 1980s. But again, it's been expanded to um, you know, include these other resistance axes and also Shia groups as well, so you can lump them together in there. Where the resistance and the Ummah intersect, Palestine being the obvious example, you know, it's a cause, as I said, that's fundamental to the resistance outlook as well. Um, and we see it in the fusing of resistance in the Lebanese case uh, with, with Iranian support with that of the Palestinian cause and Palestinian factions in their common fight against Israel. Um, and also, I think, in a lot of the anti-sectarian discourses that the Islamic Republic likes to try and promote, you know, in terms of Islamic unity. And I think, actually, if we were to look at the, the, the top triangle above Iranian foreign policy, so where Shia, Shiism, resistance, and Ummah intersect, so where all three cross over, that's probably where you can put the idea of Iran's own war and terror, the anti-Takfiri you know, anti fight, the fight against anti-Shia extremist groups as well. Um, where the Ummah and the Persian world intersect, uh, I think, you know, that you can see those examples in Iran's Central Asia outreach. You know, remember with Central Asia, we're talking about, uh, you know, part of, of, of the world that's uh, with the ex acceptance, exception of, of some Ismailis, is, is mostly Sunni or, you know, also conditioned by 70 years of Soviet atheism. You know, Iran knows it can't overtly take a very Shi or resistance-themed approach there. You know, it has to think about what's, what works best, you know, what is geopolitically expedient. So... Iran's foreign policy towards Central Asia is often couched in terms of that common Islamic heritage and history, the, you know, the historic role of the Persian languages, common uh, religious and literary figures, that kind of thing. And it's really important in terms of how cultural diplomacy is expressed. And then the final example of whether where the Persian world and the Shi'i world intersect, an obvious starting point would be the links with the Shi'i Hazara in Afghanistan, Iran's supported Hazara communities since the revolution. Um, but it's also really interesting to look at this in terms of the cultural links Iran's made with, with, or continues to promote with South Asian Shia communities in Pakistan and India, which are a really important focus of a lot of its cultural diplomacy work as well. So we see a lot in, in, in Pakistani Shia regions. Um, Iran's also been very keen to sponsor Persian literary events and activities across India too, again, sort of emphasizing these cultural commonalities that draw on the, you know, the former role of Persian as a court language of the Mughal Empire, its influence on Urdu, things like that. Um, but what's missing here? So, like I say, most of this is to do with Iran's immediate geopolitical neighbourhood. And you'll forgive me for adding more circles, but I think we can conceive of this sitting within uh, a kind of wider regional system. So you have a first concentric circle here. Um, you know, they're important external factors. Again, so coming back to this, this sort of uh, more kind of IR language, uh, that play into all of this. And I think the intensity or the level of their use and their own engagement with them often comes down to geopolitical expediency. So what is it geopolitically expedient for Iran to follow up or to pursue and what isn't? Now, the role of the US is a big factor. You know, it plays a major role in the resistance worldview, but I think, you know, we can see it as a key external, I mean, arguably, you know, I think a systemic determinant as well. And that entity suits a lot of Iran's foreign policy narratives because it drives so much of its ontological security from its position vis-a-vis -vis the US. You know, because where would we be with, you know, without the role of the US as the chief protagonist in Iranian foreign policy? You know, so it's expedient to keep referring to the US's pernicious role in regional international affairs. And this scheme, it doesn't explain everything. This is not a perfect model by any means. I'm not claiming it is. So you know, if we look at the Ummah, 
There are numerous examples of Iran not full, fully, fully following through uh, on causes of concern to the wider Muslim world, notably on Kashmir, notably on, on Uyghur persecution in China, for example. Same with the Shi'i world. Also, Iran has a very difficult relationship with Azerbaijan at the moment. We've seen increasing protest of Iraq's Shi'i population against uh, over, um, overbearing Iranian influence as well. Um, but I think you know there are some other interesting areas. You know, geopolitical expediency plays uh, quite an interesting role in terms of relations with the Taliban. Now, over 20 years ago, late 1990s, you know, Iran nearly went to war with the Taliban um, because it, it murdered uh, 12 Iranian diplomats in Mazar Sharif, and it actively supported anti-Taliban forces, the Northern Alliance. But now it's having to coexist and develop relations with them, you know, and, and sort of bring them into this, you know, resistance counter hegemonic fold, arguably. Um, I'm getting towards the end here. <laughs> so th this wider systemic environment, this final concentric circle, I think that I th these areas are mostly relevant, as I said at the start, to, to you know, regional subsystems that Iran is either part of or is neighboring. Um, but these you know, more systemic issues do play a role. So the whole notion of independence, you know, which is key actually to Iranian foreign policy, you know, this idea of neither east nor west in, in, in Khomeini's famous formulation. That could arguably form a fifth circle, potentially, if we want to complicate things more. But that was really more of a response to the features of the international system, I think, at a time that was still shaped by the bipolarity of the Cold War. But I think this whole notion of independence is something that's closely aligned with this resistance identity, um, hence the very crudely drawn arrow <laughs> going both ways up there. You know, I think that it forms part of the heritage of, of the resistance um, identity, and, and it's perhaps where I think Iran's conception of wider global order and with it the international system more broadly um, comes into play most prominently. Um, and this notion of resistance and with it independence as well, I think it shapes that broader worldview. Uh, it can be applied to both regional politics, uh, ex existential issues of national security, uh, and also the questions of how to respond to hegemonic powers in the international system. And, primarily the US, you know, so we have ideas then about resistance economy, you know, in response to decades of, of economic sanctions, you know, greater economic self-sufficiency, that kind of thing. And, and that has important corollaries, I think, for uh, how Iran conceives of wider global order, you know, its desire to see a more multipolar world, and uh, this is why you're seeing moves towards being more explicitly Eastern orientated in its recent foreign policy, you know, furthering its relationships with Russia and China. Um, capitalizing on, on you know geopolitical shifts um, like we've seen with Ukraine for example you know try and help realize and expedite the shift to what it conceives of actually as a more just world order and uh, which ultimately for Iran means a decreased role you know for the US both globally and, and close to the home in the Middle East of course as well and I think that's um, you know a really important domestic variable actually which has has important implications for understanding how Iran engages with, with engages with wider systemic issues and so that's why I think there is a slight neoclassical realist bent to what I've been discussing here. You know, these various identity categories, they help, help actually shape a lot of this material engagement. Uh, and I think in the case of resistance especially, you could perhaps make a similar argument for the Ulmo as well. They provide the terms of engagement, really, or that Iran has with wider changes um, in, in, or developments in the international system uh, that will then impact on Iran and its national interests. So I'll wrap up. I mean, there's a huge amount to unpack in all of that. Um, I think ultimately these identity markers are rooted in key domestic concerns that are intrinsic to the Islamic Republic's worldview, but they are co-constitutive of its relationship with the outside as well. And they show how I think these different forms of identity are, are fundamental to understanding the roots of, um, of foreign policy of a state like Iran, because they imbibe that foreign policy with a depth of meaning that can't be explained away by just purely systemic determinants, which is why I like to you know, combine the two here. And yes, the wider systemic concerns of, of neoclassical realism are, are definitely an important contributing feature. And when they, you know, they, they vacillate, they, they oscillate, they, you know, when they're tied to a clear case such as the US or, or global shifts, you know, they're, they're very important. But I think the, the, the core identity features I've mentioned here have a, a key role to play and explain some of the directions that Iran's foreign policy has taken in recent, in, in, over the years, really and especially in its immediate environment. Now, I don't think they're perfect categories. You know, I think geopolitical expediency often wins out and refutes these quite neat categorizations. Uh, but ultimately, I think these identities are tools that are both applied and described regularly uh, when we look to try and understand Iran's foreign policy during the Islamic Republic era. I'll leave it at that. Wait, any questions? Thank you.
Super. Thank you very much, Eddie. Then we will, with this, we will open the floor to our audience. Feel free to pose any questions that might have arisen or maybe questions that you already came with. Please go ahead. We have a microphone. All right, should I answer that and straight away or any more? Do we have any other question that we should listen to at this point? Maybe answer this one yeah, and then yeah. we, we take the next one. Okay, great question. Yeah, and by the way, I, I don't have to answer questions on what I presented. Anything is, is fine with, with, with me. Um, um, yeah, I think it does, it, it does have some relevance for, for where the axis of resistance might go. I think what happened in, in the last 10 years, certainly after... Iran and Saudi Arabia had this rupture of diplomatic ties. Obviously, things were very tense anyway. The axis of resistance, you know, as, as this kind of multifaceted grouping, alliance network, whatever you want to call it, um, started to make, you know, very strong... Other members started to make very strong statements against Saudi Arabia. As, as you might remember, you know, you hear Nasrallah um, from Hezbollah making very strong statements against Saudi. Same goes for, obviously, the Houthis and, and, and elements of the Iraqi popular mobilization forces. So what happens now to our enmity, <laughs> all that slandering, all those, all those bad words? Well, I, I, think, I think they'll quietly put that to one side. Um, it, it was a useful uh, rallying cry for them, um, you know, having this, this very clear bad guy, bogeyman, in the form of MBS, for example, I think was useful for them especially when it could be tied to things like Daesh, you know, and, and that, you know, it's seeing that they, these are people, these are just, you know, Wahhabis who are anti-Shia kind of thing. And so they could tie that to Saudi Arabia quite clearly. And, I mean, going back to some of the artwork that I showed before, I had numerous examples of, of you know, this sort of resistance artwork where it's, you know, Saudi flags and Israeli flags combined and all that. It's all quite conspiratorial thinking. Um, I, you know, but I, since... That you know agreement has been reached, brokered by China in March. I, you know, you're seeing um, very positive noises, of course, uh, and then you're seeing uh, potential end of, of of the conflict in Yemen. I mean, it was never purely a proxy conflict, but um, you know, it obviously has a big impact on on things there. So um, I think it. Yes, they don't have the same vitriol in their statements towards Saudi Arabia anymore. Um, you know, they, they all have their own vested interests. These aren't. They don't. These different actors in the axis of resistance don't purely follow only what Iran says. Ultimately, Iran provides a lot of funding for them and support. But you know, the Houthis have their own interests. You know, Hezbollah has its own interests. It's the same with same Iraq as well. So you know, they have local agency and their own local concerns too. So they've lost. Yeah, they've lost a, a bad guy, I think. But um, ultimately, I think they're sort of in favour of anything that de-escalates. Um, and um, I gave a response to a question early on, on the video before everyone came in, which is how, how does which identity stream does this relate to then? Um, and I think that the notion of resistance is important here, actually, because, like I was saying, with those wider global issues, I think it comes to the fore because it's about promoting greater multipolarity uh, and about reducing the importance of the U.S. because the U.S. isn't seen as an honest broker by, by the Islamic Republic. So, you know, to have China broker it is, is, is very pleasing. And, you know, any Iranian press and government commentary has, has been very supportive of that and says that this is indicative of you know, a greater multipolar world and, and a move towards reducing the US's influence. Do we have more questions? I, I have oh. some questions myself, oh, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can always ask you. Mm. Uh -huh. So we go to the other side. Um, thank you for the lecture, that was really interesting. Um, I was wondering, in terms of ideology, how does Iran relate to India, considering mm. The ideology of the current government there. Great question. Well, <laughs> like I said, it, it will sometimes um, make a point of, of, of Kashmir, and sometimes it won't. <laughs> now, if it needs, 
India to buy its, uh, to be crude about it, <laughs> if it needs India to buy its its oil, uh, you know, and it's under more sanctions or whatever, then, you know, it won't make a big fuss uh, about anti-Muslim sentiment of, of, of the you know, of the BJP. But, you know, times where in Iran-India relations were very good during the Khatami period, for example, and that's when BJP were in power in the you know, late 90s as well, under, under Vajpayee. Um, so... It's really interesting. This is where this notion of geopolitical expedience, I think, I haven't ruminated on it too much, but I think that comes into play then. It's ultimately about, you know, what serves its national interests. So it will, you know, make great play of, of deeper cultural links um, and will be quiet on, on combustible issues, you know, when it suits it. So it's very much sort of pursuing national interest, I think, um, in that regard. Yeah, you'd expect Iran to be louder <laughs> on these issues. Um, not always the case. Anna, would you like to hand it? Hi. <clears throat> I would like to ask you if you if you can mention the differences between the foreign policy of Donald Trump and the current foreign policy of uh, Biden mm. regarding to Iran. <coughs> and do you think that um, with this government, American government, it is it possible to resume the, the nuclear agreement with Iran? And if the problems, the domestic problems that Iran is having, can be a problem to reach this agreement because, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's not very good of no, course. for the public opinion to reach an agreement with a government that is killing its people. Of course. Great question. And many different levels to that. So, um, I'm not an expert in it. I'll give the classic excuse and say I'm not an expert in US foreign policy, but of course US foreign policy always is, is relevant when it comes to Iran, you know, and this is the point I was making before, you know, it, it, it occupies such a central role, doesn't it? Um, it's interesting. I mean, there, there are some stark differences, you know, the obvious one being, you know, one nearly went to war with Iran and, and assassinated, you know, its highest ranking military figure, um, and, and the other, you know, came to power on, on a platform of promoting the return to the JCPOA. But then again, I think Trump is, is such a maverick that you can't really, um, I mean, I, when he came to power, I thought he's either going to build a hotel in Tehran or he's going to bomb Tehran. You know, you can't, it's, 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 it's that difficult to predict. Um, but ultimately, you know, I think Trump was, was really held hostage to, to his sort of vested interests um, with, with certain figures in, in, in the region. But Biden, I think, has been constrained by this um, much more acute focus on what's going on domestically in Iran. This is an interesting thing, the classic kind of d Democrat ideals of, you know, promoting um, you know, democracy and, and um, supporting democratic movements and, and, you know, opposing oppressive regimes. Um, you know, so in many ways, you know, th there could have been more common ground between Trump and Iran. If you look at how, you know, Trump supported so many other autocrats in the region, you know, the same could have been said for Iran. You know, what's the difference? You know, there, there, there are many other regimes um, killing their people, sadly, as well. So um, I think you therefore you get a much more kind of uh, idealistic foreign policy under Biden, which is then, you know, reduces its room for manoeuvre because of that focus on, an understandable focus on those those domestic issues. So some big differences. I mean, in terms of the JCPOA, the, the nuclear deal, I just think we see this in Iran-US relations all the time. You know, I remember back under Khatami, you know, there's this grand deal offered, you know, complete access to all nuclear um, activities, a complete reduction of any support for, for um, um, allied groups in the Middle East um, and for rest restoration of diplomatic relations. And, you know, that was rebuffed by the Bush administration. So there's always this difficult dance where you have one slightly pro-Western or one more, um, you know, American president that's more open to rapprochement and they never quite marry up. But I think that there are some incredibly strong lobby groups and, and diaspora groups in the States as well, which make themselves very clearly and loudly heard. And they seem to have more, have the ear more of, of, of Biden as well. So you'd think, yeah, you think there should be a greater chance under Biden, but uh, we, we haven't got anywhere with the nuclear deal yet. I, I still have hope. I'm always an optimist. You know, I, I believe in diplomacy over everything, and, and I think that's the only way forward, really, to, to, to solve that problem. Um, the alternative is to perhaps do something that's a bit more regional focused and, and you know, a kind of base it on the recent regional diplomatic moves. Um, 
But it's difficult. The U.S. is, you know, there's this sense, even though the U.S. maintains the largest military bases in the Middle East still, there is this pervading sense that the U.S. is drawing back from its regional role, that we're approaching a much more multipolar region, more, more multipolar world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, um, yeah, I think that, that sort of changes the dynamics sort or of the perceptions of, of what they can get um, you know, from that relationship. Sorry, it's not really an answer, <laughs> just some observations. But. <clears throat> Did we have a third question here? Is that true? Hello. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I have a question. First of all, regarding the four concepts, uh, maybe you could add a fifth one, which would be more linked to the economic interests of Iran mm. and uh, more specifically the IRGC. Um, yeah. I'd like to know if these four concepts are driver of uh, Iranian foreign policy or more uh, cards used by the Iranian authorities in order to justify their foreign policy. And I have a last question uh, regarding, well, it's, it's on Shia uh, creed. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, we know that Iran is espousing the Shia, the 12th Shia version of the life of Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know the relation with the other Shia minorities, like the Zaydis, mm -hmm. well, they're not technically Shias, but the Zaydis in Yemen, yeah. um, well, the other, well, also in, in Lebanon, um, Ismailis and other minorities. How, I'd like to know if they diffuse, they try to diffuse their own model, or if they are like more tolerant vis-a-vis -vis these Aha, uh -huh. okay, great. Three very diverse questions, but very interesting <laughs> ones. Thank you. No, really good. So yes, I mean, it, although I'm talking about uh, how some of these things feed into material interests, I think you know it does. There's a bit of a, a gap here when when it comes to um, more economic understandings and the IRGC. I think you mentioned, um, you know, are seen as the sort of ideological guardians of, of the revolution of course so uh, are fundamental to the, this sort of resistance um, worldview but of course you know they have huge economic interest in Iran and perhaps you know the preeminent economic power and I think you know most people a lot of analysts think that you know in the event of a change in government it's most likely to, to shift to an IRGC controlled government you know um, more, more, more overtly anyway than it is currently now um, and you know obviously we have these you know parallel military structures in Iran with the IRGC running entirely separate to, to the conventional army as well and, and having all those economic interests. So I think there's a good argument for having um, having s at least me noting you know, that more kind of economic angle and how it feeds into elements of Iran's in, you know, wider international political economy. Um, I would probably just complicate things and add yet another circle around there, but I think <laughs> it would get very confusing. Um, the second question, are, are, these, are these drivers or, car, uh, or, or kind of calling cards? Again, e excellent point, and I think perhaps I wasn't super explicit in this. I think they can be drivers, but I think they're more useful cards to be employed, uh, deployed or applied as and when you know, the geopolitical situation uh, presents itself. So I, I think um, I would come more towards the, the latter interpretation. They're, they're reference points uh, in, in, in many ways, which, which can be utilized and they're malleable as well. And they cross over in many ways. And then in relation with, with, with other Shia or, or nominally Shia denominations, I mean, it's not exactly my field of expertise, um, but um, of course, you know, it's, it's been utilized a, a, as a way of, you know, uh, providing common cause with certain groups. I mean, certainly with Lebanon, and, and in Iraq, you know, that you know, you you are looking at a common budget and, and you know, and and um, and shared sort of ideas, you know, that, that that cross borders, and that's really interesting because you have this wider transnational construct, um, you know, that that crosses over um, national borders, but you have different sources of emulation, different budget, you know, it, you know, Hezbollah know that they can't have. Institute Veliat de Faki in Lebanon because they're only one of many minorities, you know, and the same goes for, for Iraq as well. So there's sort of there's an inherent pragmatism there amongst those groups. Um, I think you know when it comes to the Zaydis, obviously different 
different group. I, I mean, you know, they had there were moves even, you know, to try and bring Alawi into the sort of Shia fold, mm. into the Shia communion as well. Um, and, and again, done in quite an instrumental way, in a way of just sort of, uh, you know, making use of, of some very small semblance of commonality. So I think we do sometimes see some in, instrumentalization of, of, of sect there. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. A lot to think on, though, so thank you. Good questions. Thank you, Eddie. I'd love to hear from the other side as well once more. <laughs> no pressure. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Elisabetta. Could we have the microphone? Of course, you use models. <laughs> and this is the issue, and you try to fit into the models mm -hmm. some <coughs> well, concepts to fill them with, uh, with meaning. Uh, but you see, I think this, this has a lot of limitations, this, this system of this model system. Because, well, for instance, all the, the external roles, I mean, the external forces. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking of China because mm -hmm. first, the first intervention was about the new deal between Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Iran because, uh, concerning Yemen. Mm -hmm. so, but who was the mediator? The broker was China. Mm -hmm. So um, in this case, you center everything on, uh, on uh, Iran. But uh, there are other players. So I don't know if the model I think it's satisfying to look at. <laughs> Might not be satisfying to explain things. I mean, it's it's really a, it's, I use it as a slightly it's got a pedagogic device, I suppose, in in a sense. It, it, it's something to uh, to try and see where certain things more. It's more about where things intersect, I think. So it's more about the the, the previous slide where you see those different areas. Where it does come slightly uh, unstuck, I think, is in those. Uh, more external features. This is this is very much Iran centric. This is about what you know is used to describe meaning in Iranian foreign policy. And I think you can these are malleable constructs which are very much from from the view from Tehran kind of perspective. Of course, so you know it, this is why with 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 the with the China role and and the Iran Saudi rapprochement. Yes, it doesn't necessarily immediately fit. You can say, yes, it's, a, it's just a, a wider systemic thing. But actually, it does cut to the core of, of something that Iran feels is important about its position in the world. And that is that notion of independence, ultimately resistance against you know, global hege uh, hegemonic powers, you know, against uh, existing order, against unipolarity, stuff like that. Um, so I think it needs refinement. Like I say, it's not perfect. It's something of a working model. Um, but... Um, I like diagrams, <laughs> and they help me get my ideas t together. But uh, for me, the interest, you know, the interesting stuff is always when you, you drill down into these areas, and then you start to make the links across them. But I take your I take your point certainly. Do you have any more questions? But generally, Eddie, we please. <laughs> Saudi Arabia and Iran being brokered by China. What is your what's your view about that? My view well my view that it's uh, view. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think it represents uh, yeah. as yeah uh, as I said in response to, to the first question, it represents for Iran, you know, it represents a chance to 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 show uh you know, that the US has a less important role, ultimately. That's how it's being spun, okay, you know, in your own press. I mean, personally, I'm, I'm in favor of any form of rapprochement that reduces the opportunities for conflict in, in the region as well. Um, so, you know, and if it's, um, you know, China played an absolute blinder, to use a <laughs> very English Id idiom, but, it, you know, it, it didn't, it was a very low-cost intervention from China. China has managed to not really get hugely involved uh, in the political machinations of Middle Eastern politics. It's obviously done a huge amount economically, you know, as part of its, its wider strategic uh, 
um, initiatives, Belt and Road, etc., cetera, um, and is, is seen by regional actors as, as having, playing a much more even-handed role. You know, th this rapprochement was never going to be facilitated by the US because the US can't be trusted as, a, as an honest broker, certainly not by Iran, um, and increasingly not by Saudi Arabia as well. And I think the really interesting part of this is that we're seeing this much more, you know, initially this more muscular, more activist foreign policy of Saudi Arabia, you know, was predicated on this very muscular nationalism and, and MBS trying to, you know, make his mark and having all this foreign policy adventurism. You know, now we're seeing a much more of a diplomatic face. And I think that's partly related to this sense that I was saying of wider global shifts. Yes, it's perhaps overstating it to say that the US is completely in decline and it's, you know, <coughs> still very present in the region. But I think it... Saudi Arabia is seeing that picture as well, and that's why that confluence is happening and, and, and can think, well, actually, well, China's not going to ask the same questions as the US, so we're going to deal with them, you know, to be, to be, to very, be very blunt about it. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Because Eddie, I would also like to chip in <laughs> with Please. something. Um, because from all of what you have said, you know, all the different identity markers mm -hmm. and that Iran is trying to build on communalities, getting close to, um, to others, there is a lot of discourse as well of Iran being in isolation, in mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the international community. But actually, this might not be the case at all. And how successful has Iran been with, with this strategy? You know, um, how maybe has it changed over time as well? Mm. Iran also, you know, for, for decades has had this sort of idea of turning more to the east mm. um, and connected to that. Um, how successful has Iran been generally when we look at, at the countries uh, themselves? Because you have done field work, mm -hmm. for example, in Lebanon, mm -hmm. you know, how well is Iran's um, discourse or Iran's efforts received? Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. Um, so in terms of success, I mean, it's a notoriously tricky thing to, <laughs> to, to measure. No, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Especially when, you know, because I, I don't deal with uh, a lot of uh, very material uh, economic stuff, which could be a, a, mm. a measure, but certainly in economic terms, no, because obviously the, you know, the sanctions don't help that, and Iran's behavior neither. Um, you know, there, so there is a sense of receptivity, I think, when it suits the interests of, of, of other partners or states with which Iran's dealing with, um, you know, this is why this, you know, when it's geopolitically useful for them to do so, um, which is why, you know, I think you see, you know, sudden moves by Russia, you know, to be very blunt about it. Again, you know, Russia is suddenly much more interested in, in pursuing things like the north-south transport corridor, which is connecting Iran, uh, Russia to India through Iran. So, um, when it serves you know, countries interests when there's wider shifts in, in in the international order international system things like the russia ukraine war which mean that russia has to go right you know we need to new markets we need new 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 sources of, of, of trade um so i think uh, those external factors um play into it but i think your question was more about the sort of commonalities and the identities wasn't it mm -hmm. and and how that has been useful in certain cases on the ground Again, Iran knows which constituencies, I think, you know, it, it's too easy to paint, although, of course, there's extremists and there's hardliners in the Iranian polity, you know, it's too easy to paint them all as just completely crazy. You had cases that were just, just ideologues. You know, there's some really savvy, smart people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs often, you know, who, who are really well-versed and, and understand these, the way things work. So they know that they can't be trying to export the revolution. Well, they stopped exporting the revolution a long time ago, of course, you know, but they, they know that that kind of message is not going to be well received in certain in certain quarters, which is why you know going back to the India point, you know, then they're, they're not going to make a, a big fuss about anti-Muslim pogroms or, or you know or Kashmir in, in India. Um, <coughs> it's why that they'll you know not pursue um, you know overtly revolutionary messages in their foreign policy towards you know countries that won't be receptive to it they you know they're they're aware of the constituencies that may be more receptive and of course so in lebanon the lebanese example that's only you know within a certain milieu and you know i, I did some it, interesting i did an interview with um one of the people who's in charge of hezbollah's cultural 
cultural output, so was in charge of their kind of theatre production, their, um, th that kind of stuff, um, and, and who helped build their, their, their museum as well in, in southern Lebanon. And, you know, he said a very interesting thing. He's like, you know, for us, you know, in Hezbollah, Lebanese Shia, you know, the kind of this religious element and our links with Iran, they're very important, this kind of sense of wider... Uh, transnational solidarity, but actually often the message that we need to promote in the Lebanese case is, is a national Lebanese message first and foremost, you know, mm -hmm. so you go to their, you know, Melita Museum, for example, and there's not lots of Hezbollah flags everywhere and, you know, and things like that. I mean, it, it, it's about the Lebanese national victory. So, you know, people mm -hmm. are aware of crafting the message depending on the audience in, in mm -hmm. question. So I think you do see that. I, you know, I think the success is, is limited. I, I, you know, I think it's it's there in, in, in the communities and the people who, are, who want to hear that and who can gain from it. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, super interesting. Yeah. In that sense, it might reach more the upper echelons, right? Yeah, I mean, it's or often... Not necessarily get, uh, it comes down to, yes, know, to the yes, people. Yes, this is the point. Yeah, so I think mm -hmm. in a case like Lebanon, which I've, I've done research on with, you know, with like the paper I published with Simon recently, yeah, you know, that is, uh, there is a, a down to the people, so, you know, uh, that garden that I've mentioned was given as a gift to the people of Southern Lebanon. You know, they, they, they you know, sponsor a lot on, on the ground there. However, a lot of this stuff that I was talking about, you know, this is much higher level, you know, and it's, it's often, you know, it's window dressing. And it's mm -hmm. like the point you know, is sometimes it's, it's, it's a bit of a calling card, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. just a way of sort of, Hang on, there's a bit more depth to this, you know, that we've right. got more to more to give. So it's it's for, it's important in a diplomatic sense, you know, as well. Mm. Yeah. Do we have any closing questions? Anything you cannot uh, go home with? <laughs> then otherwise, if there's nothing pressing, then uh, you shall be released and thank you very much to this wonderful lecture hey. dr wasnich thank you for having thank me thank you for coming pleasure thanks for the questions thank you all right great well, good questions yeah. Yeah. fantastic yeah yeah let me get rid of that model before it gets quite <laughs> no very good